it's wonderful to be able to come together to worship our Heavenly Father this morning as we've done and are doing. But we'd like to extend our gratitude and our thanks to Him for making this possible. It's good to have everyone with us here today. We have had some who have been gone due to surgeries and procedures who are back with us. It's good to have you back. Good to, everything is going well. And we will always continue to pray for those of our congregation who request prayers on their behalf. And so um, whether the prayer request is something of a physical nature or a spiritual nature, we we'll always do make certain to pray for one another. This morning I want to talk to you about a very simple subject. At least it appears simple on the outset, but we live in a very physical world, and so there may be obstacles in our way. And sometimes we are our own worst enemy. We are the biggest obstacle that we face from time to time. But this morning, I want to talk about the importance of pleasing our Heavenly Father, or more, how are we to please God? Now, if you know anything about the Bible, this might seem like an impossible task. Because we're talking about the one who created the heavens and the earth, the entirety of the physical universe. And we feel like ants in front of him. We are so insignificant. We are so um, just seemingly unimportant the way we might look at ourselves. But yet, notice the word father. This is very important. Because the idea of him being our father makes us important to him. So much so that when Adam and Eve sinned against God, and according to Romans chapter 5, through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and death spreads to all men because all sin, Romans 5 verse 12, that has happened. The Heavenly Father saw to it to make certain that his creation would have a way out of that sin. And so when we talk about pleasing God, let's view this from the standpoint of being able to please our Heavenly Father. Now, if you want to look at a couple of, uh, if you want to look at a good example of this, think about Jesus. When you look at the life that Jesus lived, we find that Jesus pleased his Heavenly Father. In Luke chapter 3, there in verse 22, here we have Jesus there uh, having been... Um, baptized by John the baptizer. Jesus comes up out of the water. There in verse 22 of Luke 3, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Now, I do believe this was more for the people standing around, but it shows God's approval of Jesus. Some. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, Peter is remembering the Mount of Transfiguration. And there at the Mount of Transfiguration, it is the same idea being expressed by the Heavenly Father regarding Jesus. Also, think about a prophecy of Isaiah in Matthew chapter 12. Even Isaiah, many, many years earlier, saw within a prophecy that Jesus would be pleasing unto the Heavenly Father. Let's start at Matthew chapter 12. Let's begin reading there in verse 18. Matthew writes, and there in verse, um, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I'll put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not quench till he sends victory, sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. So Matthew helps us understand that even Isaiah foretold that Jesus would be pleasing unto his heavenly Father. And even in John chapter 8, verses 28 and 29, this ultimately was Jesus' goal. Now the question is, well, what's the point? Is it possible for us to please our heavenly Father? Well, right off the bat, I want to say yes, but there's this huge obstacle. This obstacle is that we are in the flesh. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church of Rome, over in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7, let's look at there real quick. And there's a lot more, of course, to the context of Romans chapter 8 that we could look at, but we're going to focus right now on verses 5 through 7 for this lesson. 
Paul writes, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because a carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Now, without going into a long explanation of this, what he is basically saying is that there are two parts to us in a manner of speaking. We have the physical body, the carnal man, this flesh, and then we have the spiritual man. It is that spiritual man to which Paul refers in Ephesians 2 when he says we have been made alive. All right. The, we who are once dead in our trespasses and sins, God has made us alive through Jesus Christ. And so the question is, what's going to be the director of your life? Are we going to live our lives fulfilling the desires of the carnal man and not worrying about the desires of the, physical, the spiritual man? Or are we going to live our lives focusing on the desires of the spiritual man? And then we'll deal with the carnal man's needs within accordance to the word of God. Now, the world looks at it from the perspective of the carnal man. That's really all that matters. That's all important, the here and the now. That's why Paul says here, for to be carnally minded is death. He says, because the carnal man, the mind is enmity against God. So then if that's the case, how do we do this? How do we live our lives pleasing unto God? And Paul tells us in that verse, and we'll build upon that here, we do this by being spiritually minded, by seeking to please our Heavenly Father. And if we're going to seek to please our Heavenly Father, here's the first thing we're going to do. We need to seek His approval. We need to recognize that it is important what God thinks of us. It is important the way that God looks upon us. The idea is to try to persuade God, if you would. And turn with me, if you would, over in the book of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 10. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the churches throughout Galatia, and this is the New King James translation, he says, For do I now, there we go, for do I now persuade men or God? For do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Go back to the carnal versus spiritual concept. Now we have trying to please God or please man, which, who will we try to please? The English Standard Version, you'll see on the screen, renders it for, am I now seeking the approval of God or of man? That's really the, the I like the, that translation a little better. Who are we trying to seek the approval of? Are we trying to seek God's approval or are we trying to seek man's approval? That's going to determine everything. Who are you trying to make happy? You know, and if you want to add in a third party to that, you can add yourself to it. Are you trying to make yourself happy? Ultimately, if we want to please our Heavenly Father, we need to seek His approval. And if we have that first and foremost, if we seek Him above all else, then we'll find ourselves being able to do that. We'll follow the right path. We'll embrace the right doctrine, teaching, behavior, mindset, heart. Whatever, whatever you want to put in there that involves us serving God, we'll seek what is right before Him. But let's move on to the second thing we need to do. Is if we're going to please our Heavenly Father, we need to walk in a way that's pleasing unto Him. What we're making, the connection here that we're making, is a walk that is governed and determined by our faith in Him. All right, we can walk anywhere we want to walk. You know, if you decide you're going to go walk around Mitch Park, there's a bunch of different trails you can take and things like that. You know, or if you want to stay on the actual walking track, you might be able to stay on that. But there's a bunch of different paths as long as you're walking, you don't think much about it. But here we're talking about a walk that is determined and established by what our heart says. And so if we're seeking to please God, if we're seeking His approval, then our walk is going to be governed by that um, desire to please Him. And therefore, we're going to seek what is pleasing unto God and live our lives according to that. The idea of walking is the idea of behavior, the way we live our lives, the things that we do, the things that we say, the things that we think. All of these things are involved in the idea of our walk. The Apostle Paul over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, note with me if you would there, the first eight verses there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And let's start reading there in verse 1, and let's read down through verse 8. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the brethren here in Thessalonica, 
He says, finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Notice the connection there. How you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of you and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So who are we going to seek? Are we going to seek God's approval or man's approval? We'll turn the question around. Who are we going to reject? Are we going to reject God or are we going to reject man? And what is interesting about the text here, and we touched on this just a moment ago, verse 1, he says, Just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, and then he references the commandments that they had heard from him. And he lists a few specific ones beginning there in verse 3. And a lot of it has to do with this concept of possessing our vessels in honor. Keeping ourselves holy before the Lord. Just as God who is holy calls us, we too ought to be holy in our conduct towards him. But this can only be done if we walk according to his word. Now, someone may say, now wait a minute, does it really matter what we do outwardly? Isn't it really, isn't really only the heart that matters? Well, I'm going to say yes and no. Yes, it is the heart that matters. But if our outward selves is not governed by our heart, then our heart's not right with God. So if our heart is right with God, if we're seeking to serve Him, then outwardly we'll live accordingly to His Word. We'll consider a situation, right or wrong, should I do this, should I not do this? And we'll say, I want to please God, so I'm not going to do this. Paul mentions here in the context probably one of the greatest challenges. Um, right up there along with, with, with greed and, and envy, you've got sexual immorality. And we're living in a world today that that pretty much governs the way many people behave and make their choices and decisions in life. But Paul says, for Christians, we ought to walk in a way that is pleasing unto God. One more time before we move on. He said there again, notice in verse 1, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God. So, yes, it does matter what we do outwardly. It does matter that we make the decision not to abide by His, we make the decision to abide by His Word and not to follow after what the world would have us to do. But let's move on to the next answer. How does a person please God? Well, we do so by walking worthy of the Lord. Now, this seems like a somewhat of a challenging statement to walk worthy of the Lord. Well, we may say to ourselves, I can't walk worthy of the Lord. I'm never worthy of the Lord. But remember, he died so that you can be worthy of him. He paid the price for the sins that separated us from God so that we can walk worthy. This is the passage that was used for our scripture reading earlier in Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12. I ask if you would turn back over there for a moment. Colossians chapter 1, beginning there in verse 9. He says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, <clears throat> being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Now, it's interesting when you read through the text there, the potential that exists within every Christian, within every child of God. He first off says in verse 9, he's praying for them that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. 
Can you know the Bible and understand the Word of God? Well, the answer is yes. Can you know and understand the new covenant of Jesus Christ? The answer is yes. Can you understand Micah 4? Well, we're working on that. Some passages, a little bit more of a challenge, but you get the point. Where it matters, we can grow in this knowledge. We can grow in this spiritual understanding there. And then he says there in verse uh, 10, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work. We're talking about walking in the Lord, walking worthy of the Lord. There's the idea of being worthy of the Lord, bearing good fruit, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, giving thanks to the Father. This is the way that we are supposed to live our lives. This is our potential, made possible not because we are great, but because Christ died upon the cross of Calvary and gave us a way out of sin. And gave, you know, think about it, before Jesus died, you could, you could say no to certain things, but fundamentally sin was still against you because you had not always said no. But now that Jesus Christ died upon the cross of Calvary and all your past sins have been washed away, you can say no to sin and have it matter. Think about it. You can say no to sin and have it matter. Because now when you say no to sin, you're keeping yourself in fellowship with God. 